The library was my space, and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. This is, you'll have to excuse me this evening if I pause every once in a while. It's just me kind of soaking in the energy of real people being in the same room as me. Uh, it is really amazing to be uh, back hosting and be with real people. So thank you for being here this evening. It's amazing. You think back, what, two and a half years ago and uh, uh, COVID-19 really threw us threw us for a loop. Uh, you know, if life had a bunch of gears, COVID-19 was a massive wrench thrown into it. Uh, I don't think any of us thought, though, that two and a half years would be so affected by uh, that illness and still is affecting our lives. So it is nice that we could be here in the same room. Uh, we are back and uh, back in full effect. Toronto, the city I'm learning in the two uh, years that I've been here, two and a half years that I've been here, is, it's amazing in the way that it's a, it's a home to some of the biggest and best talents in Canadian fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Uh, you and I actually get to rub shoulders with writers in pubs, theaters, uh, at Toronto book events like Word on the Street and the International Festival of Authors, and of course at uh, Toronto Public Library events like this at 100 branches across the city. Now on Monday night, November 21st, our five finalists, uh, who I, I'm sure you know so much about by now, you're getting their books before the night is over, aren't you? Our five finalists will appear on the 21st at the Historic Arts and Letters Club on Elm Street, where they'll read from their books and discuss their shortlisted books. This city is really spoiled for literary choice, and I know it'd be easy to take for granted uh, living here if you're born and raised, but uh, from somebody who moved here, we're really spoiled in this city. And uh, each year, a jury of five dedicated, sleep-deprived book lovers reads through stacks of books that evoke our city, this year's jury considered 73 titles published between June 2021 and May 2022. And we salute the jurors. Um, we, they probably deserve their own round of applause for the work that they put in. But we salute the, yes, give them a round of applause for their work. They gave so much time and attention to the task of picking their five favorite titles. Now let's get right to it. Uh, um, this year's Toronto Book Awards jury consisted of author Anne Y.K. Choi, whose novel Kay's Lucky Coin Variety was shortlisted for this prize in 2016. <laughs> Retired TPL librarian um, Margaret Henry. <laughs> uh, a poet I had the pleasure of meeting for the first time uh, this evening, uh, Khashayar Kes Mohammadi. Author Philip Dwight Morgan. And Indigenous educator Brenda Wastesekut. The City of Toronto and the Toronto Public Library thank you profusely. Now tonight's book awards finalists have each evoked Toronto in their own unique way. Camilla Gibbs, The uh, Relatives, is a novel about what it means to be a family in our modern world what our, our responsibilities to each other with increasing options for how to create a family. Uh, the jury said, The Relatives is a beautifully written exploration of family, loss, and love told through the interconnected lives of Tess, Emily, Lila, Adam, and Sophie. Their lives, much like their inner worlds, bristle with conflict, tragedy, and incertitude. Through their stories, Gibb invites readers into intimate places of her characters' lives as they move through memories across continents and grapple with the vulnerability that belies their, inter their interdependence. With the relatives, Gibb offers readers a novel that troubles their sense of obligation and stretches conceptions of the modern family. It is dark, tender, elegant, and full of surprises. And to read briefly from the relatives, please welcome 2022 finalist Camilla Gibb. Thank you. I have to echo Ismaila's um, sentiment that it's so lovely to be amongst people. Um, one spends a lot of years without people in the course of writing a novel. Um, there are three intersecting stories here. I'm now going to read from the first story, which is Lila, who is a social worker in downtown Toronto. Um, and she's part of a team where people get an, uh, a care team for cases where the police have become involved. And in this case, there's a child, probably about 11 years old, who has gone, or who has been found in High Park, wandering around in her pajamas. 
Lala is reluctant to take this on because she has an aversion to working with children, which is something to do with her past. I buy muffins on my way into work. In the consulting room, I tape a large sheet of paper across the table and place a box of pencil crayons on top. My head is cracking from last night's wine, but at times like this, facing a daunting challenge, I almost feel like the rawness of being compromised by a hangover lets my defenses fall away. When Robin's case manager drops her off for the first of what will be two 45-minute sessions a week with me, Jackie ushers her in. She stands behind the girl, holding her by the shoulders. Robin's eyes wander everywhere around the room, taking in everything except my face with its forced smile. She's smaller than I would imagined, her head looking too big for her body. But I know from her file that she's put on 12 pounds since being placed in emergency foster care. I wouldn't put her at 11 if it weren't for her face. She's lost some of the skim milk pallor of the first photograph and has developed a certain definition around her cheekbones and her eyes. Robin, this is Lila. I'll leave you two to get acquainted, okay? Um, she squeezes the girl's shoulders before leaving. And from the way Robin turns her head toward Jackie's voice, I can see she feels some comfort with her. I point at the chair opposite me at the table. Robin sits down, never looking at me. My chair is slightly lower. I want us at the same eye level. Do you want to take off your coat? I ask quietly, miming, shrugging off my own. She shakes her head. I lift the box of muffins from the filing cabinet and set it on the table. I open the lid. She leans over and stares into the box. Have one, I say. She pauses, chewing her bottom lip. Well, I'm having at least one, I say. Robin reaches in, her hand covered in scratches as if she's been picking raspberries, and she quickly plucks a muffin from the box. She cups it in her hand, holding it against her chest, and then she bends her head and starts pecking at the muffin. I can see why Jackie calls her Robin. I ask whether she wants another one. She snatches one from the box and shoves it into her coat pocket. She takes another and thrusts it into her other coat pocket. She clearly understands the essence of whatever I'm saying. I'm glad you like them, I say. I point at the paper and the pencil crayons. It's best to start with something tangible between us. I thought we could do some drawing this morning. I take a dark blue pencil crayon from the box and start to draw a rudimentary picture of a house. So when I was your age, I lived in a house with my mother and father. I draw three stick figures beside our little Victorian row house. Robin leans in to study the picture. I offer her the box of pencil crayons, but she quickly sits back in her chair and crosses her arms across her chest. It wasn't a big house, but I did have my own bedroom, I say, indicating one of the windows on the second floor. And we had a backyard with an apple tree. I draw our rectangular yard and a gnarly tree. The apples weren't good to eat. They were crab apples, tough little sour things, and they shouldn't really be called apples at all. And my school, I say, drawing a dotted line, was a couple of blocks away. I draw a long rectangle punctuated with windows. I loved school. At least I did until math started to get confusing. And on Thursday afternoons, I walked here, adding another dotted line for my piano lesson with Mrs. Nagata. Robin slowly unfolds her arms and places her fingertips on the edge of the table. She starts moving her fingers against the laminate. I place my own fingertips on the edge of the table. She made me practice my scales over and over, I say, moving my fingers in succession. Sometimes she made me practice with my eyes closed. Robin's eyelids flutter closed, as mine do. It was only a year after playing nothing but scales that Mrs. Nagata finally let me start on a piece of music. Minuet in D minor, pretty standard. I start to hum the first few bars of the minuet. I watch Robin for some time, not wanting to interrupt as her fingers move up and down an imaginary keyboard. And then she stops, drops her hands into her lap, and open, opens her eyes blankly to the ceiling. 
Learning to play the piano was one of those things on a long list of things that my mother had never had the opportunity to do, and so it had fallen to me. I inherited it not as an opportunity, but as responsibility. I was faithful to my lessons, diligent about practicing, at least until adolescence. It wasn't just rebellion. I was more interested in the sounds beneath the notes when I listened to Glenn Gould and Keith Jarrett, the humming and the grunts and the tiny explosions of breath, which seemed to be telling a more difficult story. My relationship to music was a technical one, not an emotional one. They were musicians. I was not. But this broken bird of a girl might be. Nothing in her hand positioning suggests she's ever had lessons. The music is just there in her, as if waiting permission. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Camilla. I think uh, one of my favorite things is actually watching authors read from their books. Uh, it's one thing to hear what they have to say and hear them read, but to watch their faces and their body language as they read from their book. That was wonderful. Thank you. Well, our next finalist is Phelan Johnson, whose short play, Two Indians, considers cousins Wynne, who lives on the res, and Roe, who lives in the city where she has fled following a family tragedy. When the words truth and reconciliation and missing and murdered are everywhere, how do two Mohawk women stand their ground? Well, Phelan Johnson's powerful Two Indians is a, a darkly comic look at the landscape of being Indigenous. Uh, in its uh, short list citation, this year's jury wrote, Two Indians is about love, courage, and reclamation. Wynne leaves the res to find her cousin Roe in Toronto, with the promise of the best view of the full moon, she lures her to a back alley where they talk about the most difficult time of their lives. A family tragedy is uncovered, and Roe comes clean. Phelan Johnson shows how indigenous families have survived everything. Uh, residential schools, the 60s scoop, the current scoop of children by supporting each other through it. Uh, Two Indians tells the stories of addiction and recovery, loss and reclamation with humor and love. As the moon rises over the city, Wynne and Roe rise up to meet the challenges awaiting them back home. This book is a must read for students everywhere and I, I'm hoping that I made you a little nervous uh, that we're all gonna be watching how you move your body and your face as you read. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Phelan Johnson. You get nervous as soon as you're, you hear your name and then you kind of jump in your seat because you realize, oh yeah, right, I'm here. Um, so, Two Indians is a play, um, and I wrote it um, based out of a experience on my res. It's a common experience on a lot of, experience on a lot of reservations, reserves in Canada and in the States. Um, car accidents are a bit of an epidemic in our communities. Um, we lose people, and so I wanted to take a look at that. There was an accident that had affected some people in my family, and I kind of wanted to look into that and try and, and find some healing in that. Um, and so that was the basis of Two Indians. So it is a two-hander, which means I'm going to be playing two people. Uh, so just bear with me as I play both Roe and Win two cousins. Those roads, I know them like the back of my hand, the curves, the bumps, the potholes that come up after the rain. I know them. You know, I see them sometimes. The roads? The cousins? You do. Where? Wherever it's busy. The street during rush hour downtown, the subway, the mall when I'm on lunch. I see flashes of their faces for a split second. Then they're gone. Lost in a crowd. I wish I could forget that they are dead long enough to really think it's them, to really give over, you know? I'd like to forget for a few seconds. I saw them once, all three of them, in a dream, right after it happened. You never told me that. I wasn't sure you'd want to hear it. Of course I want to. I want to now. In my dream, I woke up on the couch in Grandma's house, that old gray one. I sat up and I looked around for grandma and I couldn't see her anywhere, but, but I could hear the clock ticking, that damn loud clock she has, tick, tick, tick. And I could smell something baking. It, weird to smell in dreams, but I could. It was cookies or bread or something, something in the oven. 
I walked into the kitchen, and there they were, the cousins. They stood at the height chart against the wall, measuring each other to see who had grown the tallest since they'd last checked. I, I don't know why they would. We'd all stopped growing a long time ago, but there they stood. Seth kept going up on his toes, and Christine kept yelling at him to quit cheating. Rayanne just kept giggling, kind of nervous, the way that she always did. And then they noticed me, all of them at the same time, and for a second, they stood looking at me, and, and then like a silent agreement between them, they grabbed me and pushed me against the wall. They were laughing, and they were trying to hold me up against the wall to measure me. They kept pushing me, and it got really rough, and I tried to get them to let me go, but they wouldn't. I got scared, and, and I didn't know what to do, so I yelled, you're dead, you're all dead, leave me alone, you guys are dead. And then they stopped and backed away, and they started laughing even harder than before. And it got really deep sounding, not like their voices at all. I covered my ears and closed my eyes, and, and I went to scream, but I couldn't. I opened my eyes, and they were gone. I was still in the kitchen, and, and I could still smell the cookies or whatever and hear the clock, but they were gone. I turned and looked at the height chart, and their lines were gone. I could see you and me, but they weren't there anymore. I walked back into the living room, and you were there with Grandma. You guys were picking lint off the carpet in the front room. You both looked up at me and smiled, and I woke up. Wow. What do you think that means? I don't know. I don't think it really matters. She still has it, you know. Has what? That damn loud clock? I'm not surprised. And she still has your grad picture hanging right beside it. Yeah? Yeah, I graduated with honors and yet you still get you still get top billing somehow. Does she still pick lint off the carpet like that? On her hands and knees? Her knees are too bad now. Must bug her. My dad got her a new vacuum, but she says it makes her hearing aid ring. Well, I may have top billing beside the clock, but you'll always be taller. At least I have that. You know, you know what my earliest memory is of Christine? Well, not of her, but with her. I must have been three or four, really little. She stayed over one night, and we woke up early in the morning before anybody else, and we watched the sun come up. It was fall time, so the trees were bare, but the sky was orange and pink and blue and beautiful. We got my crayons, and she showed me how to blend the colors into each other from yellow to orange to pink to blue. She showed me how to draw tree branches thin and black against the bright sky. She told me I was good, and I believed her. I felt proud of myself. She was so good at drawing. I used to be so jealous. I used to want to be like her so badly. Well, thank you, Phelan. Um, two roles there. Well done. <laughs> Our third finalist is H.N. Khan, uh, whose debut novel, Wrong Side of the Court, is a story about 15-year-old Fawad Chowdhury, who lives with his mother and his sister in a tiny apartment in Toronto's pre-gentrified Regent Park. Uh, said the jury, Fawad Chowdhury fantasizes about being the world's first Pakistani NBA player. But he's got a lot stacked against him, including family expectations, financial hardships, and gang violence. Set in Regent Park and nearby neighborhoods, Khan skillfully spotlights Toronto's diverse peoples, history, and cultures as integral to the stories unfolding. From the delicious paratas that Fawad indulges in uh, to the play-by-play -play action on the basketball court, Khan engages us with a vivid writing style and a tenacious protagonist. A gritty and honest coming-of-age story, wrong side of the court, ultimately transports readers into the lives of Khan's characters, shedding valuable insight into the life and challenges of a modern youth living in Toronto. To read from Wrong Side of the Court, please welcome H.N. Khan. Hello, everyone. 
Um, first of all, it's uh, wonderful to be here um, and, and be part of a city celebrating books um, at a time when I feel like books really are a refuge against a lot of what's happening in the world. Um, and some of you might also be wondering, did he even play basketball? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, I was just not particularly good. And, uh, and so this is a way for me to you know, fantasize myself uh, about two things I love, uh, basketball and uh, my mother's cooking. So um, I'm going to be reading a scene where uh, Fawad finally is working up the courage to ask his mother if he can join the basketball team at his school. <clears throat> I thought maybe I'd try out for the basketball team. You and that stupid sport are not a good match. How do you expect to concentrate on school if you spend so much time playing? I put away the dish towel and stand right next to her. Ami, I have an 85% average. Yes, but your father wanted you to go to law school. It's not easy to get in, she says. Gulnaz's daughter has been trying for the last two years. You need much higher marks. Goddamn Irfana and Gulnaz aunties and their daughters. I want to scream. I start pacing back and forth. Yeah, but I mean, you do realize undergrad will cost 40000 If I play basketball, I have a shot at getting a sports scholarship. Oof, Allah. They have OSAP or something from the government. No basketball. Pick anything else. OSAP, I mean. But that's student loans I have to pay back. You do realize that, right? She dashes a bunch of spices and a whole ton of salt into the pot before putting a lid on it to let it simmer. Then she moves swiftly to the fridge, taking out a container with kneaded dough for rotis. Her motions are smooth and effortless. She's already rolling a ball of dough and sprinkling it with additional flour before she stretches it and massages it into something she can go at with a rolling pin. I'm losing steam and she's losing interest. I need to think fast. Abu would have let me try out, I say. She loses a little color from her face. I've struck a nerve. Second time I've used the dad card today. This time, it just might work. Well, too bad for you that he's dead and can't give you permission from his grave then, isn't it? Ouch. She's putting in extra elbow grease with that rolling pin. I mean, okay, wait. How about I average 90% this year? Could I at least try out then? I don't even know if I'm going to make it. Silence. I'm on the edge of my seat. Come on. There's a heart in there somewhere. There's got to be. No. She puts the flattened dough on the pan. It starts rising as she moves it around with her fingers. Doesn't matter how hot it gets, she refuses to use tongs. My final shot was swatted into the crowd. I can't get past her. I should just head back into the locker room, hang up the jersey for good. We hear the apartment door rattle. Jamila unzips her knee-high black-heeled boots and sets them aside. Next, she chucks her backpack onto the couch. She's got shiny leather pants on with a hot pink top. Only she could pull this outfit off and make it look normal. Hey, kiddo. Hi, Ami, she says, heading straight to the kitchen sink and pouring herself a glass of water. Mom doesn't pay much attention to either of us. You're late. Jamila gulps down her water and sets the glass on the counter with a loud thud. So? Silence. I wish I could talk back to mom like her. Where did she get it from? I have to pull out the wild card. It could go either way. I have to try. It's down to the wire. Wait, maybe, just maybe, she could help me. Jamila, tell Ami to let me try out for the basketball team. Thank you. Were we all transported back to being like 12, 13 years old and talking to our parents and begging for things? Thank you so much for that. Hamayun. Our next finalist is Sarah Pauli, a first-time author whose memoir, Run Towards the Danger, is a collection of six personal essays in which Sarah confronts her own memories of stage fright, high-risk pregnancy, and sexual endangerment, among other things. Sarah Pauli is an Academy Award-nominated screenwriter, director, actor, and now author. Our jury called Run Towards the Danger a brave, intelligent, and sometimes funny book of essays. Sarah Pauli explores how, quote, the power of my adult life informs the relationship to my memories. After struggling with the aftermath of a concussion, Sarah was advised by a specialist to engage her fears 
and run towards the danger. Well, she does so with riveting clarity in this fine memoir, proving that she is as fierce as she is technical, as vulnerable as she is malleable, as strong as she is critical. Please welcome Sarah Pauli. Thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be included uh, on this list with the books that have been nominated tonight. I've read them all. They're amazing. I really encourage you to buy them all. Um, and just thank you to the jury for including me. Um, so my book is, um, is a series of personal essays that are written with the intention of making you feel really sorry for me. Um, actually wasn't the intention, but a really advantageous byproduct. Um, so uh, the, this one is about a high-risk pregnancy that I had. How much did you bleed, asks the soap opera hot doctor who lives two doors down from my house. You can check my underwear if you want, I say defeated. It's over there. My hand waves weakly towards the crumpled pile of clothes on the chair in the corner in a gesture of, all is lost, I might as well disgust you. I found out this new neighbor of mine was a doctor several years earlier when he moved into the semi beside ours and all the women on the street kept whisper hissing towards my porch. Have you seen the new hot doctor neighbor? <laughs> I did not know he worked as an obstetrics follow fellow in the hospital I am scheduled to give birth in and am currently bleeding in. I only ever imagined him working on the set of a soap opera hospital, having illicit affairs with soap opera nurses and such. I watch him gingerly pick up my bloody underwear and look back at me. He's not my type anyway. Too much face moisturizer. <laughs> I've been rushed by ambulance to Mount Sinai Hospital in downtown Toronto. I have called an ambulance for myself and waited, ashamed, as I heard the sirens get closer. Hearing emergency vehicles arrive for you is unexpectedly embarrassing. All this for me? A fire truck arrived first and the fire truckers, tr firefighters <laughs> looked as hesitant as I was. I got the sense that a pregnant woman bleeding out was the kind of emergency call they prayed the ambulance would beat them to. We made awkward chit chat as I told them not to bother coming up on the porch. One of them shuffled from foot to foot by the curb, looking anxiously down the street as the siren sound of the ambulance got closer. When the paramedics arrived, I insisted on walking myself into the ambulance. I asked them about their labor negotiations. There was a potential strike coming up. They asked me questions about my condition and I answered them briefly, but I was weirdly skilled at maneuvering the conversation away from the terrifying thing that was happening to my body and back to labor strife. I stubbornly refused to lie down on the stretcher. They pushed me into the hospital in a wheelchair and when we arrived at the obstetrics floor and they said to someone behind a desk, she's 33 weeks, previa, bleeding, it seemed as though every person in my field of vision joined a sprinting parade behind my wheelchair and into a delivery room. Everyone was running down the hall. I held on to the armrests of the wheelchair for dear life. There were about eight people, staff doctors, residents, and nurses in the delivery room, looking nervous and ready to catch something. That's when soap opera doctor appeared, out of nowhere, followed, it seemed, by some kind of key light that illuminated the sheen of his abundant face moisturizer. I ask him if he wouldn't mind shoveling my walk when he's done his shift. He laughs lightly, an indulgent doctor laugh. Not my type. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Well, our last finalist is Adrian Shad, who collaborated with authors, historians, um, Afwa Cooper and Carolyn Smarts Frost to update their excellent 2002 nonfiction book, The Underground Railroad, Next Stop, Toronto. Within its pages are, st are stories of courageous men, women, and children who overcame barriers of prejudice and racism to create homes, institutions, and a rich community in Canada's largest city. Said the jury, before and during the American Civil War, 30,000 to 40,000 freedom seekers from the United States escaped slavery and came to Canada. Three distinguished scholars of black history tell that powerful story in this concise, readable, and well-illustrated book in a way that's accessible for students and general readers of many ages. The detailed social and political history is brought to life in dozens of remarkable profiles of the women, men, and families who made that dangerous journey. We learn how they escaped, the terrible choices they often made to leave spouses and children behind, the jobs they found, the businesses they built, and the ways they contributed to their new home. Originally published in 2002, this new edition retains the appealing format of the original, but has been thoroughly revised and updated with much new information, including a chapter on the archaeology of Toronto's African-Canadian past. The Underground Railroad enriches our understanding of the history of Toronto. Please welcome 
Adrian Shad to read from the Underground Railroad. Next stop, Toronto. Thank you very much. I guess I was the only author who didn't realize I was going to be reading from my book. <laughs> and a thanks to Catherine, my publisher, for hurriedly running to the back and getting a copy of it so I could have something to read. Anyway, I thought that I would read a, a passage about a fairly well-known story on the Underground Railroad. Uh, but before our book, we didn't know uh, where the, there's two couples involved in the story, and we didn't know exactly where they settled when they got to Toronto, but now we know because of the book. Two couples who made a trip on the Underground Railroad were immortalized in the classic work, The Underground Railroad, written by African-American abolitionist William Still in 1872. According to Still, Frank Wanzer and Emily Foster and Barnaby and Mary Elizabeth Grigsby escaped from Virginia on Christmas Eve, 1855, in a carriage owned by their enslavers. Two other men were attempting to escape with them on horseback. The group left during the Christmas holiday because they would get that, that would give them a couple of days extra time before anyone would realize they were missing. After traveling for 100 miles or so, they were met by six white men and a boy who demanded to know where they were going. Realizing that they were runaways, the white men ordered them to surrender. It was at this point that both the black men and the women drew guns and knives and stood their ground. Shoot, 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 exclaimed one of the women, a pistol in one hand and a long dagger in the other, fiery determination in her eyes. When the would-be slave catchers realized that they might not make it out alive, they moved aside and let the couples go on their way. The white posse did, however, manage to capture the two men on horseback. All of the freedom seekers were young, in their early 20s. The two women were sisters from the same plantation. Frank Wanzer and Barnaby Grigsby were enslaved on nearby farms. The two couples made it to Philadelphia in the free state of Pennsylvania. There they were taken in and cared for by members of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. This was one of the many groups of Underground Railroad activists that assisted freedom seekers in eluding the slave catchers. After recuperating in Philadelphia, the couples were sent on to Syracuse, New York, and the Underground Railroad station master, Jermaine Logan, uh, and they met the Underground Railroad station master, Jermaine Logan, a black minister there. Frank Wanzer and Emily Foster were engaged, who were engaged, decided to tie the knot. Reverend Logan performed the marriage ceremony. From Syracuse, the couples went on to Toronto. Mrs. Agnes Willis, wife of the Reverend Michael Willis, who helped Harriet Tubman take, raise money for her journey south, was the treasurer of the Toronto Ladies Association for the Relief of Destitute Colored Fugitives. Mrs. Willis met with the couples and assisted them in obtaining employment. She wrote a letter back to William Still of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee as follows. Toronto, 28th January, Monday evening, 1856. Mr. Still, dear sir, um, and this is an excerpt. They, they are all of them in pretty good spirits, and I have no doubt they will succeed in whatever business they take up. In the meantime, the men are chopping wood and the ladies are getting plenty sewing. We are always glad to see our colored refugees safe uh, here. I remain, dear sir, yours respectfully, Agnes Willis, treasurer to the Ladies' Society to Aid Colored Refugees. Voila. Thank you, Adrian. You did quite well with a surprise reading. Really well done. 
Um, to present the finalists with their prizes, uh, we welcome City of Toronto Councillor Paul Ainsley, a member of the Board of Toronto Public Library. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to see so many people here appreciating uh, Canadian literature, and in particular, literature that has to do with Toronto. Uh, I'm, I'm both a Toronto City Councillor and I'm, I sit on the Board of Directors of the Toronto Public Library. It was of the many boards that I've sat on uh, since I've been elected to office, uh, I'm most proud of the Toronto Public Library Board. I, I, uh, my first job was in a public library in Scarborough where I used to joke that my main uh, task was convincing librarians that I knew what the Dewey Decimal System was. <laughs> you know, moving forward, uh, my wife and I, we have three children, um, one in his uh, early 20s, the other two are teenagers. And one of the things that we always did was try to instill a love of reading in them, to, to get them reading. We read with them every night at bedtime, uh, making sure they understood what the importance of literature. I, I always joke with them that, you know, you can read a book and go anywhere in the world. You can, in the universe, you can learn so much about people, places and things. So, you know, it's a great honor for me to be here this, this evening. It's also a favorite part of my job. I get to give away awards. Uh, but I'm giving awards to, to a very distinguished group of authors. I can't thank all of them enough for all of the work that they've done um, on behalf of Mayor John Tory and my colleagues at Toronto City Council. Uh, it's great to be here with so many tr supporters of Toronto's literary life, with people who recognize the critical role of artists and arts to an inclusive and uh, vibrant city. COVID-19 has been very hard on all of us, uh, cities all over the world. And I think tonight's event's very important in bringing ba people back to culture, uh, live and in person. And as another aside, uh, I was going at the door, our youngest son. Uh, so this is the second event I've been to this week. I was at the Mayor's Arts Gala on Monday evening where we proudly raised uh, close to a million dollars for the arts community uh, here in Toronto. Uh, but I was going at the door and, and I was going at the door and my youngest said, wow, dad, you were, you've worn a tie two nights in a week. I said, don't get a rash. So. You know, it is nice uh, with COVID ending and to get back uh, to some sense of normalcy, I hope. Um, the arts, they've always been a key to Toronto's success along with our commitment to inclusion, public safety. The arts are cited as one of the main reasons that people wanna live, work, and visit here in Toronto. Toronto's literary arts are truly astounding as any survey of the Toronto Book Garden will confirm. The Book Garden is located at Queen's Key Terminal in the Harbour Front Centre. The Book Garden features pavers engraved with the names of each Toronto Book Award winner since the prize was inaugurated in 1974. Names like Timothy Finley, Margaret Atwood, Kamel Soleil Lee, Austin Clark, Robertson Davies, Michael Redhill and Dion Brand and many, many more. The arts will continue to pull people from across the globe to join this wonderful city of Toronto, and there'll be great authors amongst them, such as the authors on tonight's short list of finalists. It makes me very proud to realize how vital Toronto is in contributing to the shape of Canadian literature. I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of the authors whose submissions this year made Toronto a character amongst the cast. Uh, it is now my pleasure to announce the winner of the 2022 Toronto Book Award. After much debate, this year's jury, and thank you again to all the jurists for all of their hard work, selected Sarah Pauly's Run Towards the Danger as the winner of this year's Toronto Book Award. Thank you so, um, so much uh, to the jury for selecting the book. And um, yeah, I'm, thank you. I have, okay, I wrote something to say. Um, I, I've already said it, but I just couldn't be more honored to be thought of in the same company as these incredible writers who've been nominated tonight. I've loved hearing you reading. I've loved getting to know your work. Um, Camilla Big Gibb is um, one of my literary heroes, so just to be even on the same list is just a, an amazing thing for me. Um, thank you to libraries for supporting the book, and uh, thank you to Penguin Random House for their incredible support. I want to thank 
Tanya Addison for protecting me, fighting for me, and teaching me to listen to my strongest voice throughout the process of putting this book out into the world. Um, this, oh my God, I'm gonna cry when I say this, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this book was nurtured and guided by the incredible Nicole Winstanley. Nicole, thank you for making me feel safe, for your endless patience and rigorous work, and for pushing me to run towards the danger in ways I couldn't have imagined myself. And my kids and husband, David, who kept making space for me to write this book, much of this book was written during the pandemic while we were homeschooling three kids under eight and both working, and we had no childcare. Um, as you can guess, this would not have been possible had it not been for the most supportive, aggressively optimistic, enthusiastic partner in the world. Thank you, David. I love you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, congratulations. And I actually think that wasn't an awkward start to what you said. An award for a book? That, that's, you could have left it at that and you'd done great. Um, this has been a pretty amazing night, uh, an amazing year for Toronto Stories. Uh, congratulations to all of the finalists. I think they deserve all a round of applause. And, uh, but wait, there's more. Um, the night is not over. There's a signing now until 8.30. If you would like Sarah, Phelan, Adrian, Hamayun or Kamala or all of them to sign your books. I'm going to put you all to work now. <laughs> you can go and get your autograph, uh, get, your, get your copies autographed. And just before we um, uh, turn off the lights, uh, Toronto Book Awards would like to thank all of its partners, the Toronto Public Library, Word on the Street, and CBC Radio. Thanks to each of you for coming tonight. It's been wonderful to spend this time with you here tonight celebrating books and Toronto stories and Toronto authors. We hope to see you again next year, again in person. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Take care.